Good afternoon, good evening, and good morning, depending on where you're joining this webinar. Welcome to LM News special panel discussion on living the dream as a digital nomad. My name is Young Sun Pak. I'm a professor of international business and management at Loyola Marymount University in Los Angeles, California, and director of the Center for International Business Education, often called CYBE or CYBER. This program is funded by the grants awarded by the U.S. Department of Education and sponsored by LMU Sci and also the Study Abroad Office. LMU is one of 16 universities in the country that received these prestigious cyber grants. The LMU Sci serves as regional as well as national resources to students, faculty, and business practitioners by connecting the workforce and technological needs of the U.S. business community with international education, foreign language training, and research capacities. As part of our mission to help improve global competitiveness of the U.S. businesses, LNU Cyber has been offering special lecture series on various important topics of international business and management. Today, in the spirit of celebrating International Education Week, we have prepared another great program to discuss the benefits of international education and exchange worldwide. International Education Week was created as a joint initiative of the U.S. Department of State and the Department of Education to promote programs that prepare Americans for a global market and attract future leaders from abroad to learn and exchange experiences. Today, we have invited a, a great group of experts, including a couple of LMU alumni who have successfully pursued international business jobs to share their experiences and testify impacts on their personal life as well as professional career. While physical mobility of the people ceased or reduced during the pandemic, virtual mobility of people increased, creating a new term called Digital nomad. Digital nomads work remotely, telecommunicating rather than being physically present at a company's headquarters or office. This could be a new lifestyle that could be very attractive, particularly to young generation, as you have the freedom to choose where to live and work. Yet there might be some downsides or hidden costs associated with this type of lifestyle. I'm sure these panelists will help us understand, better understand opportunities and challenges involved in pursuing international careers. Before we start the program, I'd like to introduce our Dean, Dr. Dale Smith. And Dr. Smith will say a few words to welcome you. Dr. Smith. Hi, everyone. Uh, thanks, Young Sung, very much for welcoming me. And on behalf of LMU and the College of Business Administration, it is my pleasure to welcome everyone tonight to our panel on digital nomads. I'm very excited to hear from our panelists tonight and to learn from them this evening, but maybe not for the reasons you might expect. Quite frankly, there's a part of me that's kind of sad that I'm at that age where choosing to be a digital nomad isn't exactly an option for me anymore. So I'll be listening to the panel with a feeling of living vicariously uh, through hearing from our panelists and the description of their adventures. But with that said, I do want to share that I'm a fan and an advocate of the nomadic adventurer, particularly around international business and in the celebration of International Education Week. When I reflect back on my own experiences and journey, it was that being able to be international, that international work experience that was truly transformative and likely led to what I do today. I was very comfortable as a professor in raising a family, but then I found myself nominated for what would be my nomadic experience, a Fulbright opportunity in Hong Kong. Thus began my journey and my passion for international education. And just like you'll hear from the panelists tonight, the experience was incredible and, and truly life-changing. Now moving to another location means uprooting your family, renting your house, finding someone to care for the dog, and going to a location, in my case, where I didn't speak the language. But it would also be a chance to meet new people, learn new things, learn the schedule of the MTR in Hong Kong or the mass transit, the importance of where a chicken's head faces at a dinner table, understanding the concept of guanxi or what it means to be invited to a colleague's Chinese birthday, even the honor of receiving a Chinese name 
that's not linked to what your name would translate to from a transliteration perspective, but a name given to me by a poet because of how a particular department in my new organization thought of me. And thus I have a Chinese name of Xi Dai Yi. It would lead to me venturing into a new career as an administrator in higher education, and as a result, growing personally and professionally. Now, the nomadic adventure is so interesting, and we're gonna hear about it from a digital perspective, but even just nomadic adventure internationally, I became comfortable jetting around Southeast Asia. I made tons of friends, grew a network of professional colleagues, and these are people I continue to engage with 10 years later. In short, it shaped me into someone who believes deeply in that international experience and likely explains my commitment to global education and the affiliations that our business school has now with the International Association of Jesuit Business Schools, the Globally Responsible Leadership Initiative, and our Global Business School Network. So tonight, the theme is digital nomads, and our nomads are here to share, for it's the true sharing of that experience that opens up our windows to the world. And I know we'll enjoy hearing it. So once again, welcome, and I'll kick it off to our next speaker. Thank you so much, Daryl, for your warm welcome and sharing your personal experience and adventures as part of your career development. Now I'd like to introduce my longtime colleague and friend, Dr. Ellen Ensher, who's going to moderate the panel discussion today. So let me just briefly introduce Dr. Ensher. Dr. Ensher is a professor of human resource management and she's an expert in mentoring. She has received numerous teaching awards, including LMU's Fritz Burns Distinguished Teaching Award. She's the co-author of Power Mentoring and has published more than 50 articles and also the book chapters on mentoring. Dr. Ensher has served as a Fulbright specialist, specialist in Finland and frequently teaches executives and undergraduate students abroad. Her work is frequently cited in leading media publications, including Fast Company, Forbes, and Wall Street Journal. Dr. Ensher has shared her ex expertise worldwide as part of the U.S. Embassy's Invited Expert Speaker Program, and for many other global or organizations as well. Dr. Ensher, thanks for joining us today. And now I'd like to turn the program over to you. Could you please introduce our panelists? Absolutely, my pleasure. I am so happy to be here and I'm so happy to have everyone join us. Um, we are very, very grateful to all of you. And I know we are all joined together in our passion for global adventures. So we have three amazing panelists um, who are joining us today. So I am going to start with Rosie Vargas. Uh, Rosie is an LMU alumna and uh, actually, full disclosure, um, <laughs> was one of my former students. She has a master's from Gonzaga. She has a real passion for travel. Uh, during the pandemic, she was had taken the year off to travel everywhere in the world. She I, I don't want to tell you too much about her, but I will tell you that I have traveled with her and she is the person who always has everything you need in her giant purse. <laughs> so that is Rosie. Warm welcome back to the virtual bluff, Rosie. Um, <laughs> secondly, I'm just going to introduce all three of them and then I'm going to start asking them questions because I know you really want to hear from them and not me. Um, I want to welcome back another alum which is Max Banton. I got to know Max, um, yeah, I guess it was 2019 when Max took our summer abroad class in Rome and he was a fabulous student. I will say about Max, he worked hard, he played hard, and he was the one who always found all of the best and most fun things to do. Um, he's a content creator. He's recently back from a year, and I've been following him. And I have to tell you, so many of our students have been inspired. He loves adventure, travel, physical fitness, and fashion. He is um, somebody who shortly after high school left to join the Marine Corps and traveled many times there. He's just back from a year of solo travel in Latin America. So welcome 
back next. And Steve, I I apologize because I did not ask you how to say your name. I'm going to guess and then you're going to correct me. Let's see how I do. Zentarensky. I mean, that was that was that was fairly close. That was pretty close. That was pretty close. I, that, was, that was incredibly gracious of you. I'm not going to I'm not going to divulge how how it's actually said. I'm just going to let everyone here try eventually. And at the end, so I'll, I'll let everyone know. Uh, Steve is what I would call an honorary LMU um, alum. He is not an LMU alum, but he is definitely a friend of our university after being here. And I have a feeling, Steve, you're going to get a lot of LinkedIn requests from our students. Um, I know on LinkedIn, you mentioned that you're helping SaaS companies turn the complex into easily consumable, copywriter, content marketer, storyteller, digital nomad, ambassador, and currently coming to us from Zagreb, Croatia. Um, so just a warm welcome, Steve. And I, and I know you, you have some amazing content. I've also been following you and all three of you just inspire and excite me and fill my feed up with um, optimism, hope, and a little bit of envy at times as well. <laughs> so I'm going to start. I, I gave a little introduction, but I think I'm going to probably start with Steve this time since he had to endure my name slaughtering. Um, and I would just love to ask you, you know, to tell us a little bit about you know, what you are doing right now, what you love most about being a digital nomad, and maybe is there an exemplar story that you feel like encapsulizes life as a digital nomad? So, Steve? No, wow. Yeah, so that, thank you for, for the warm intro. Uh, I, I went to Ohio State, so just so we know where, where I went, um, but I'm happy to be part of this fam now, which is which is pretty great. Uh, so yeah, as you mentioned, I'm, I'm a copywriter, but prior to that, I was a video producer and a photographer and I had a little intro with slides and stuff, but I've, I'll, I'll skip it. Um, this is, this is better. Um, so that pretty much has been professionally what I've been doing. And as far as a story that exemplifies the digital nomad sort of lifestyle, actually recently I was in Herzegovina, the near um, the border with Bosnia in a region of uh, Bosnia called Herzegovina. And there's a festival called Bikliada, which is goat milk, fresh goat milk mixed with like very like unaged red wine. I don't know what the purpose of this festival is. I was just invited to it by, by people I know here in Croatia. And they're like, we're going to, we're going to get, we're going to get a picture of someone like milking a goat into a cup of wine. That was the intent, and then to just celebrate this this sort of fiesta situation. We get there, there's no goats. Um, <laughs> so my friend is like, all right, you have to go to Bosnia now, and uh, you have your passport with you? I'm like, yeah, I, I, weirdly, I do have my passport with me. So I got into a car with a bunch of strangers, went over to Bosnia, I milked a goat into a cup of wine, <laughs> drank it, which honestly, much better than it sounds. It's not actually good, it's just much less bad than you would think. And uh, then came back over the border and went to this festival all night. Then went back to the, the coast to split where I was staying. This was like a month and a half ago. So stuff like that is weirdly common um, in my life. But that's, that leads to sort of why I like this lifestyle is that if I can get the work side of it done and focused on and completed for all my clients, I have the freedom to do these sorts of random immersive cultural things travel where, wherever I want to. I've been in, I've worked from seven countries this year um, and just kind of exist in a way that suits me. Yeah, and what what inspired you in the first place and how long have you been living this digital nomad lifestyle? Uh, well, it's my parents' fault. I'll say that. That's, that, that's they moved over from, from the Soviet Union in 1980. And uh, so like they, they, transformed their lives at, th I'm 36 now, at 35, they they moved over. And so that was already like in the DNA, I guess, uh, when I was born was to experience and explore stuff. Cause anytime I'd have like break from school, it's like, let's hop in the car and drive to Hilton Head, let's drive to Florida or whatever. So it was, it was this thing that uh, basically any free time was meant to be used exploring stuff in the world. 
And that sort of, once I finished school, it kind of led to having a completely unconventional career. I never worked an actual like job in an office. I went straight from school to working on film sets in uh, New Jersey and New York. Then I was in Colorado as a ski bum working at a, in Aspen. Then I moved to New Zealand to work at a ski resort, came back to Jersey, and then started working on cruise lines as a digital marketing specialist, then a multimedia producer. Then I directed music videos for people on artists on The Voice and started writing. And so I just have continued to do random things that make me happy and I could find a way to make money doing. Love that. Thank you, Steve. I appreciate it. I am going to now go ahead and jump over to Max. Hey, Max. Hi, so, how are you? <laughs> so good to see you. There's a little hug. <laughs> um, so, or, and I just want to say, um, tell, us, tell us a little bit about, you know, what you've been doing. I know you just got back from a year of travel and tell us a little bit about um, your plans and and what you want to share about the digital nomad lifestyle. And if you have a story to share that you feel like exemplifies the experience or your year, go for it. Yeah, so I, I got back from traveling in Latin America for one year, uh, solo travel. I've traveled to over 31 countries in total, but this last year was uh, my first year by myself. And yeah, I done a lot of adventures. Um, some of my favorite adventures were in um, the Amazon rainforest, you know, just, out there hiking through the jungle, seeing anacondas, seeing tribes that, you know, are indigenous and just seeing how they live and getting to experience that culture. One of the things, like my favorite part about traveling was the, the culture I got to experience while traveling and just seeing life like through a different lens and it just kind of change your perspectives on things. And, um, you know, I did, I went to Latin America. I didn't know any Spanish and I, I picked up another language. So I was also thankful to learn that as well. And uh, the world is, is so big. So I'm definitely planning on traveling a different part of the world next. Uh, I was originally supposed to go to Bali, but uh, with COVID and everything, my plans got kind of canceled. That's how I ended up here in Latin America. Ellen, you're on mute. I saw that. <laughs> Where are you right now? So I actually just got to Guadalajara, Mexico yesterday. Hmm. Okay, great. And my my question is, I know that you have created this YouTube channel and you're vlogging. Um, how is that going? And is that, you know, from an income perspective, enough for you to keep doing what you're doing? And do you see yourself continuing to do this for a little while longer? Yeah, so I, I definitely see that as a, a means for me to keep doing this a little while longer. I kind of look at it as... Um, building my personal brand right now. And actually, this last year traveling, I've been looking for opportunities to, you know, actually create a business in the tourist in industry. And um, all that with my videos is kind of gonna help with marketing in the future and, you know, doing market research right now, but it's definitely sustainable. I, I know I don't wanna travel for too long, but, you know, after having these experiences for the last year, I feel like it would be kind of challenging just to come back to, uh, a so-called regular life, like as of this moment. Mm -hmm. Okay, great. And I'm going to go, thank you, Max. Welcome, welcome. I'm going to go to Rosie now. So Rosie, kind of the same question for you, telling us a little bit more. I didn't get a chance to talk about your company, so I'd love you to tell us a little bit more about the work that you do and uh, some of you, some of your ventures and in in an exemplar story. So tell us about you. Awesome. Um, if you're just hopping on um, and haven't heard, I am an alum of LMU. So I graduated in 2008. And I actually had a few internships while going to LMU. And I started working full time even before graduation. So it's very like senior year, I was already working in retail. Um, I majored in management and human resources, um, which is what I was called at the time. And I worked in retail with L Brands, um, primarily with Victoria's Secret and Express for about 15 years. 10 of those years as a store manager. And probably like the whole time, um, I really wanted to go into learning and development. And so Ellen is, Ellen Emsher is my mentor and does training and development and uh, management development as well. So we're um, on similar career trajectories and 
Um, I also love to dance. And I, I feel like that's so, so important to my story because uh, I was really burning myself out at work. I was working a ton, um, trying to move up the ladders of going from retail so that I could finally be in a learning and development role. And I used dance as an outlet. Um, and with retail and dance combined, I, I pretty much burned my body out. And so even my body uh, was even telling me I needed to slow down, that I had a pretty major injury. I tore my calf muscle. And even during that recovery process, all I could think about is like all the things that I can't do anymore or shouldn't wait to do. And I think that's when I started to think about um, a life as a digital nomad. And then um, just to share something personal is what was that thing that got me over the hump of like finally doing it is I one of my best friends who um, I grew up with in college who I traveled with a lot passed away. And so that really helped me reflect on how short life was and how I wanted to continue to spend my life um, as someone who still sometimes has trouble walking from such a major injury of burning myself out um, at work. And so I took my mentor's wonderful advice and finally started getting my master's after adding some work experience um, at Gonzaga, where my master's is in organizational leadership. Um, and I'm also continuing like education with them. And so that I could really embrace like the career change as well as just the lifestyle of the digital nomad, I put everything in storage, traveled while being a remote grant student. Um, and yeah, I think uh, that kind of encapsulates um, how I got there. And currently um, I was a digital nomad for about a year and then COVID hit. So that put a nice big pause in my travels. And during COVID is probably the worst time to do a career pivot. Um, but, you know, I, I had to have faith on my own experience and education and what I could bring. And it was like I was traveling and also still applying for remote jobs. Um, I'm currently working for a startup based in Los Angeles. Um, and one of the great perks here is we actually have offices in Finland and Armenia and are looking to open an office in London. Um, and so there, there is opportunity for movement as well. Um, and I am currently in a talent development manager role. Um, and I train sales teams, um, managers, and leaders. Um, and I think that's it. Did I cover everything, Ellen? <laughs> yeah. And now I'm going to do a quick round robin because I know people are going to be curious. So, Rosie, tell us, um, you know, over the past couple of years, where have you traveled to? Just kind of, you can rattle off some countries for us. Oh, my us. gosh. Um, well, if you guys, I use these pictures for a reason. That's me and uh, Ellen in Egypt. <laughs> um, so I've been to Egypt, Cambodia, um, United Emirates, uh, Italy for study abroad, also with LMU to visit some of the students there. Um, and Croatia is probably my favorite country to visit. Um, I also have a family house in the Philippines, so I frequent travel Philippines and Canada based on family. Exactly. And I know, Rosie, you have also shared that you're kind of part of this, you have this extended Filipino family. So part of the the diaspora so it's almost like she can go anywhere in the world and stay with people too which is yeah. pretty lovely so max thank you rosie max i'm going to jump back to you and then i'm going to jump back to steve so tell us we rattle off your countries that you've been to in your last year of travel yeah so in my last year i've been to uh, mexico guatemala costa rica colombia brazil uh peru Ecuador, the Galapagos is amazing. Oh. And Peru, amazing food. That was just in the last year. Fantastic. And Steve, how about you? I know you said you've been to seven different, just worked on in the last year. Yeah, yeah. So I was uh, I was here, here in Croatia. I went to visit family. And I consider the States like a remote best work destination now because I'm never there. So I went <laughs> remotely from Florida and New Jersey. Uh, I was in Colombia also, actually. I was in Georgia, the country, not the state. Um, was in uh, where else? Belgium, uh, Netherlands, and Albania. I think that's it. And then I was I wasn't working from Austria, but I was in Austria over the weekend because it's like down the street from Croatia. So yeah. yeah. 
So I'm kind of curious um, for each of you, and I'll start with you, Steve. If you if you could tell us a little bit about some of the challenges or, um, you know, what do you hate? Like, what's hard about this? Because I think it's easy to look at the beautiful pictures on Instagram and, um, and it's it's an it's it's a very alluring. I have a lot of students who say, "I don't really know what to do. I think I'm going to be a digital nomad." So, like, what are the challenges? What do you caution people about? Uh, well, digital nomad is not a job by itself, so you can't you can't just do yeah. It. <laughs> um, so, I think think challenge wise for me was sort of figuring out because before I was still working for companies but traveling, and now. Everything is my is my company. I do it on my own, and so figuring out how to sort of do that. The way I went was going through Upwork and you know figuring out what I wanted to write about. I actually pivoted careers during the pandemic, so it was it's interesting to hear Rosie say that it was like I get that it was obviously very difficult. That was my, my weirdly one opportunity to that I saw to change and and shift. So that was challenging. That's challenging. Pandemic or no pandemic is to is to pivot. Uh, loneliness is something that is often discussed with with people that are that are working remotely full time and are just location independent. That is that's what you make of it. I mean, like it's really easy to meet people with all the digital tools that we have. Those same tools are also very isolating. So it's how how you how you use that, how you interact with that, and uh, if you can use it for your benefit or, or sort of get sucked down into it. Uh, managing plans and like logistical stuff is weirdly like I, I so I was building my business when I was here in, in Croatia I was just here for 15 months uh, straight and then I traveled for the last seven months and I had accrued all these clients had retainers with all these companies and was like oh, I'll just I'll just continue growing as I just travel around until I come back I was unable to grow at all anything in the last seven months I did all the work that was required of me but it, if you're traveling constantly you sacrifice uh, quite a bit of growth. And I think that's not something that people necessarily think about when they're planning out these sort of sort of lifestyle moves and changes. Interesting. And why, so you said when you're traveling constantly, you, you sacrifice a certain amount of growth. Can, can you tell me more about that? I'm curious. Yeah, well, it's from a, from a business perspective. Because mm -hmm. um, I, so I, I started a company, SBT Creative, which was SBT Productions when I was doing video productions video production and mm -hmm. when i was here in croatia i was really able to focus on basically like the the building block aspect of stuff and, and getting started so i started when i was in new jersey during the pandemic and then here i was in one place i was able to really get focused when i traveled for the last seven months i was in um, georgia for a month and a half i had to plan that and when i was not working i was like i want to go see what's here i wanted to go eat the food i want to drink the wine i want to do this i want to go hiking when i'm here in the place that i'm just in I don't feel the same like let's say FOMO and so I just get more done and I can have more I use more of that time to plan and I use more of that time to sort of strategize whereas when you're just on the road you, you want to enjoy that <laughs> and so that that's where it was difficult on a personal level that's actually where a lot of growth happens um where the business isn't growing because you're immersed in cultural experiences talking to people learning from people exchanging knowledge exchanging information and uh so it's it does feed back into professional growth. It's just kind of segmented. That's how that's been my experience, at least. Oh, that's fascinating. So it's almost like when you're in your home base, you can allow yourself to focus and kind of grind more. But when you're mm -hmm. somewhere else, of course, you're like, I'm only here for a limited amount of time. I want to get yeah. out. I want to see. I want to do. Yeah. And and um, Rosie, Max, I'm glad. Um, I, I love this idea. We can kind of have a little cross talking you know, if we can imagine we're sort of in the same room. So feel free also, if you have questions that you want to ask one another or something occurs to you, you know, just, just jump in. We're, we're the only ones with our, uh, with, uh, with our, um, audio on. So no worries. Um, what about, what about you, Max or Rosie? Do you, do you agree? Has that been a similar experience with you in terms of feeling like when you're, uh, that, that a, a negative aspect can be an inhibitor of growth maybe, or do you feel like it's been different for you? I, I can relate to that a little bit. I feel like, like traveling has gave me growth in, in a different sense, but, uh, I can definitely like relate to like being at home. You, like, you have your home base. 
like you're in a good routine. That was another challenge for me traveling like every couple of months is, you know, boom, a new place. You have to get in a new routine, you know, find a new gym. And, you know, um, sometimes like when, when I was first starting, it was hard to establish between like vacation and like, oh, like this is like my job now. Like I have to make this work. But I definitely could agree to what Steve says. There is like a part of you that, you know, when you're at home, it's, it's a lot more stable and easier just to get in that rhythm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I think you have to be, um, I guess my, my, my perspective is a little, uh, I agree and then I also feel like I currently um, work full time. And so even though I spent one year as a digital nomad not working um, and I, I went to 12 countries that one year, since then um, working full time, I've been to, I want to say in the last three years, I've been to 18 countries. So uh, in that first year was new seven. So if I'm doing my math right, I've done 11 countries while working full time. And so I've had to be a little bit more thoughtful and strategic about like where I'm going, um, how much time I'm going to be there, how much time is going to be dedicated to work versus exploring. Um, I think that's one of the key benefits of like having a, a fully remote job now, which is, I, you know, I think is a growing thing um, in the industry is having remote jobs or hybrid jobs, um, which is what I have. And <clears throat> I definitely have to be more thoughtful about um, maybe getting more work done prior to the trip or like setting aside the time to explore and get the like excitement out first and then set aside time to work. Because I think there's nothing that you can there's nothing that's going to overcome the excitement of being in a country aside from just going to see that country <laughs> and so just being a little bit more thoughtful about just do it and go go explore go get lunch somewhere and see what's out there and then um being really disciplined about the time you've set aside to to do your work as well well i remember um you would you were working and you decided oh i will take a day where i'm working and then you would also sometimes play in the day, then at 5 p.m. start working. So being able to play with the time zones, has that been something that's been helpful? Uh, absolutely. So like, for example, if I, I probably get the least amount of exploring done in Asia. So like if I'm in the Philippines, I have to work overnight if I'm working Eastern Standard or Pacific Standard time versus like in Europe, um, I can wake up, explore during the day, and start work at 5 p.m. Um, I think I talk about this in actually the class, the when I guest lecture here at LMU, we talk about the mindfulness piece of being mindful of when we're most productive. And some people are just more productive at night. And so when I travel to Europe, that's probably the best time for me to work because I can get the exploring out of my system and start working at 4 or 5 p.m. And I'm already up till 1, 2 in the morning anyways, with, with or without work. So I'm able to work with the time zones in that manner and still explore and still work. Great. And Max, anything else? I feel like I um, maybe didn't give you as much, like anything else that you want to mention that you feel like you dislike or that is really super challenging um, or, you know, any, any kind of horror stories that you can share, but you were able to overcome. Yeah. One of the things that was challenging for me, uh, especially traveling a lot Latin America is that not that many people speak English here. And, you know, thankfully now I, I can speak in Spanish with them. But at first that was uh, super challenging. I didn't really talk the first couple of months on my journey. And um, yeah, I was just kind of down, but it kind of like forced me to learn the language. So I'm kind of thankful for that. But uh, I feel like everywhere else you travel, generally people speak English so that that shouldn't be an issue. And I just also want to say that community building is a, a big part while traveling too. And um, even though you're a digital nomad, there's still so many networking events going on. And, you know, a lot of, there's so many digital nomads you can connect with while traveling. And I just want to let people know that. And um, a good way to meet people is Airbnb experiences, tours, and things of that such. And, and so uh, tell us more about what that is in case people don't know. And I mean, I, I think... You, you all know I'm a big fan and proponent of networking. Um, and sometimes it's hard for people just to even do that here, like go to an event or push themselves to, you know, get off the campus and go to something. So thinking about doing that abroad, you know, tell us more about that, Max. Yeah, I'd love, love to hear more so people can learn from you. Yeah, yeah. So me, like, I, I'm a very uh, extroverted person. So I kind of can just casually start conversations and, um, 
I've been able to meet people, you know, just in coffee shops. I actually met like a fellow LMU graduate in the coffee shop in Brazil. Oh. Yeah. And, um, but I, like for people that aren't, you know, as extroverted as me, I would say uh, definitely uh, free walking tours, like just getting to know the tour guide in that city. They usually can offer you some pretty useful advice on information and might be able to connect you with other people with things you're interested in. And uh, I've been doing a lot of Airbnb and experiences tours, and I've been meeting people that way as well. And, and what is an Airbnb experience tour? Uh, so, for example, like like Airbnb, the uh, the platform, yeah, it's just like uh, local people kind of like freelancing um, and showing them like different tours, like you know maybe a a hike or like a winery. I did one here in Mexico where I went to like a lucha libre tour. And I got to meet some other travelers as well. They have like all sorts of different uh, tours and it's just like a, a local person showing you around with other uh, travelers. Hmm. Okay, I'll, Steve? I'll add, yeah, I'll add that there's, uh, in addition to that, Facebook groups, which is like the only good thing that Facebook does now is just have <laughs> groups. And uh, they're excellent in most places, um, That especially places that are on like the, like the digital nomad trail, let's say, where the lots of digital nomads go those groups people post events all the time so in colombia i was in many and there's there's always stuff in, in those groups in croatia and zagreb and split there's always stuff in georgia there's there's huge groups so those are super easy like not very intimidating ways to to do things that you, you would be interested in and uh yeah but all the things that max said are, are spot on too um so i just want to add add that little nugget mm -hmm. great what about I'm kind of curious. I'm just thinking about we have you know three people here from different backgrounds, um, you know, different different uh, demographics, different way of being in the world. What about safety? How do you stay safe? Do you worry about safety um, because you're you're a little bit untethered when you're out there? Uh, I. Well, I live in Croatia is like the safest country in Europe, essentially, like statistically. Nice. So there, like, there's just no worry at all mm -hmm. for anything. Um, but then I went I, to go back to Colombia again. Yeah, I, I, I stopped thinking about my personal safety essentially, and I got there, and it was just like a barrage of "you can't do this, you shouldn't go there." I was going to take pictures in the park somewhere, broad daylight, and I was with some local people I met for lunch, and uh, they're like, "Well, you're going to go now by yourself?" I'm like, "Oh yeah, it's like 2 p.m." Like, no, no, you got to take the camera home, go back with your cell phone. Um, so there, and then there were stories I would see on, on, on those groups, people getting mugged all the time. I never had anything happen, but I had to constantly think about it. And there's a good point that Max made about the, the English levels in South America and Central America, that they're not required to speak English. Obviously nobody is, but it's noticeably less than if you're in, in Europe. Um, I went to a brewery in, in, in Medellin, uh, Bogota Brewing Company, and I thought I was asking politely to have a beer. I was actually asking them if I could make a beer, and they were just like, "No, we 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 do that. You just you drink them. We make them." And I kept repeating, just like, no, "Can I make a beer in Spanish?" So yeah, I'm I'm happy Max has learned better Spanish than me at this point. It sounds like, <laughs> yeah. Well, I was gonna add just for me as someone who's female, I get asked that a lot because most of my travel is solo. Um, and so uh, I worry about safety much less than I think people would think about it. I think part of it is because one, I do a lot of research about where I'm staying. I literally, I take the buddy system really seriously too, just in case like I have multiple people that either follow me on find my friends or um, let people know my schedule just in case. Um, but I think how I began to overcome the fear of traveling by myself is I started to wean myself onto solo travel. So what I mean by that is if I was going to travel to Mexico, for example, with friends, I would go to Mexico like two days before everyone else to just experience that feeling of being my, by myself for like a day or two, but also knowing that they were going to come. And then the next trip was like to Toronto completely by myself, which Canada is also one of the safest countries to travel solo. So there was a little bit of a weaning process for me to like overcome the fear of travel by myself but with like repetition and practice and 
and knowing that every country is a little bit different, um, I've slowly like overcome that fear and it, it, it just doesn't, it seems so abnormal to me now to travel with people <laughs> because I, I'm so used to traveling by myself now. Yeah, I think you have to like your own company too. Yeah, and <laughs> that that helps a lot. Max, what do you what do you think about the state? Because I know you all, you've also been to Colombia, and I've seen you with big snakes wrapped around your neck, and yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, um, yeah, safety like the, the areas like Latin America. I was traveling um, Colombia, Brazil. You had to be really safe, so I kind of had uh, protocols like you don't pull your cell phone out on the street. Or anything like that only like if you're in a, a store uh you know don't wear any jewelry just just try to blend in as much as possible i did have one i guess you could say negative experience i was in uh, medellin colombia actually close to my hotel and it's what is considered to be a fairly good area a really popular area and i got uh, pickpocketed but i was like super aware it happened like i felt it and i got my phone back right away so that's like another thing with, with traveling to some of these places. Like you, I feel like you have to be a little bit more hyper alert than you would be in the States, at least Latin America, always kind of like looking over your shoulder and just, just aware of your surroundings a lot more. Mm -hmm. And Ellen, can I just add one thing? I'm Filipino American and the only other language I speak other than English is Tagalog. So I speak the Philippine language. That is actually the only country I don't travel by myself. Um, and it, I think part of it is because I'm very, like, my family is very aware of, like, the country and the research, if, especially if you're a foreigner. So um, I think just being aware of even, like, language may not always be the piece that will also secure safety. So that's something that was really interesting for me to learn as I was growing up. Like, I've traveled to so many countries where I don't speak the language, and this is the one country I can't, <laughs> I can't travel around. Um, and so that, that to me, I think was like really interesting. Um, and then Max mentioned about losing his, his phone. I think the biggest fear story that we can have in another country is losing our phone or our, our source of income. And so, uh, probably my favorite like fear story and pro probably where I grew the most is, um, it was my first day in Europe and I barely got any sleep, jet lagged, and me and a friend were on a bus in Prague, and we went and explored Prague. I was exhausted at the end of the day, falling asleep on the bus, and as I started to fall asleep, our stop came, and I left the bus without my phone, and this is like the first day of my trip. I have one of those phone cases that holds all my credit cards, so it was my source of income and, and, and communication for the whole month ahead of me for the next six countries. And so I remember my Prague friend goes, if you lost your phone on the bus, you're probably not going to get it back. There's no communication from bus drivers. There's there's like no lost and found. You're probably not going to get it back. And this just shows maybe a little bit of my personality. I looked at her and I said, well, we're going to try. <laughs> and we're going to try and get it back. And so... It felt like Mission Impossible Prague Edition because we were chasing down buses <laughs> with Find My iPhone app because she had an iPhone so that, you know, I lucked out that um, I had battery and I was connected to signal. So, but there was a lag. So every bus I hopped on, my phone just kept moving to a different bus and a train. And on the fifth or sixth bus, I remember my friend trying to follow in her car and I'm you know, hopping on buses where I don't speak Czech and they don't understand that I've lost my phone. Um, on the fifth bus, I said, okay, if it's not here, I have fully tried and I'm not going to find my phone. And the minute I was about to hop off this bus, this girl who spoke English goes, are you Rosalind? And I was like, yes. And she handed me my phone and all my credit cards and cash. And so that's one, I, I like to share this story because that was probably the scariest moment for me. But I think that it taught me so much about my, my mindset of what to do under stress. And I think we really test our, our boundaries and how to fix problems because I, I think it travel only that only travel could do because that's something I wouldn't have learned here in the States. Like I speak the, the language, I know where I'm going, you know, and I, I think it really helps you build up your resilience. So sorry if I took up so much time, but just wanted to share that. Oh, that's, that's great. <laughs> yeah. 
Well, I, I want to ask a little bit. Um, first, I want to check in with Young Sun. Uh, do you have a, I saw your hand raised. Do you want me to uh, take questions right now or can I ask our panelists a couple other things? Sorry, you can continue to go and ask the question of panelists. That was an accident. Sorry. <laughs> okay, got it. <laughs> um, so I wanted to kind of pivot our conversation a little bit here and ask you about some of your opinions. You know, you've traveled the world now. You've experienced kind of this new way of working. So we've got, you know, a hybrid worker. So you have this job where you can, you know, work from anywhere. We've got Max, who's, and, and I think Steve also are really very entrepreneurial in their approach. So what's your opinion on the future of work at this point? You know, where I, I mean, I, I kind of think we're out of the box now. Everybody's gotten a taste of this hybrid. Um, but what do you see on the horizon? You know, what technology is out there? What like if you had a crystal ball, what's next, everybody? How about Steve? Uh, yeah, actually, I I was on a different panel discussion earlier today with uh, some, some something called the Center for the Transformation of Work and uh, Open Assembly, and the topic was obviously it was about the future of work in in some sense, and it was related to um, online platforms like Upwork, and then just all that comes from that and how much more access is there for people to do stuff remotely and how companies are basically opening up the floodgates to work remotely as, as Rosie's doing. So I think the, the future is more towards that. And like I, I was looking at some stats from MBO as a research organization that was part of this particular talk and that I've used in articles that I've written before. And the, the number I'm just reading now for this, the number of digital nomads increased 9% from 2021 and 131 percent from 2019 16 16.9 million people in america um are digital nomads at the moment uh that they describe themselves as that a uh, couple more fun facts of what i think answers the question of where things are going uh digital nomads are among the workers most satisfied with their work and lifestyle with 82 percent reporting being very satisfied with their income which is higher than the non-nomads by a decent amount. So it's it's sort of trending that way and will continue to trend that way, especially with younger workers coming into the workforce that are seem to be demanding better lifestyle. And that that comes with it is sort of location independence uh, and the ability to have that if you if you want it. Um, so that's my trying to condense that down a little bit into a usable answer. I love that. I love those fun facts. I actually had to write some of those down. I, I'll send you the 16.9 oh. 16 million. And then there's projections for what, what they think will, will come. And they've, they've been doing this study for five plus years. So it's, it's an ongoing thing and they keep, they keep updating it. And so it's, it's pretty fascinating. I'll, I'll send it over. Oh, I think we would all love that and be happy to share that with this group too. What about what about you, Max? Oh, no, go ahead, Max. Do you want to go ahead, and then I'll probably pivot to like yes. your workplace for corporate people. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So I, I definitely agree with what Steele was saying. I feel that you know COVID kind of opened the opportunity for online work, and a lot of people like adapted to that and just got used to it. And even me, just traveling, I was uh, honestly like shocked just to see the amount of digital nomads that I was meeting. And uh, not to mention, you know, um, like the American dollar goes further in a lot of other countries. So it's like you can have um, a better lifestyle than you would with the job you have in America and, and still get that work. Mm -hmm. Well, I'm totally here for it. I, I can't compete with Steve's steps. But <laughs> what I do know is that... Um, Working in like Silicon Valley and in startups, uh, like towards during COVID and coming out of COVID, a lot of companies still want us to move back into the offices. And with that said, I feel like hybrid workplaces are continuing to grow. Um, and uh, I get asked a lot, especially um, at work, like how I'm able to work remotely. And I think something that's really important to keep in mind is that you can still be a digital nomad even while like 
um, still work remotely while working full time. Um, there's a couple tips and tricks though. Like if I decided to like move to Croatia for the next two to three years, I would actually have to check with my hybrid workplace to see if that's allowed. Um, just kind of like a funny story is uh, I have a, a friend who worked for a startup that got approved to work remotely, but based in California. And during some IP address reviews, they realized that they were not in that particular place. Um, and had been out of that place for more than six months and it did require to relocate back. And so one of the things that, you know, I stay in constant communication with my hybrid workplace is where I'm going to be working for and for how long and continuing to return back to home base. Um, do I envision in the future that like I may pivot and do the digital nomad thing again? That's absolutely a possibility, but um, I really love where I'm working currently. So being able to sustain this hybrid remote workplace, I think, it, you really have to um, connect with your company because everyone has different rules about what remote work really looks like. Awesome. And I'm kind of curious, I know uh, with our own diplomats, our own state department, there's always been a rule in place where people have to come home back to the US regularly. Um, because they do enjoy a, so often a nicer lifestyle while abroad and, and they make friends and they make relationships and they want to make sure that our diplomats remember that this is home. So I, I, I so there, the whole, there's a whole phenomenon of going native. So at what point do you feel like it's enough and where is home and, and what's the future in terms of um, when you'll go home and, 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 and how often do you even need to do that? And maybe this is home now, maybe just being on the road is home. I don't know. I'm kind of curious. Steve, what do you think? Uh, in terms of like when, when someone would theoretically yeah, stop this, when, when stop do you these stop? shenanigans. Yeah, stop <laughs> these shenanigans. <laughs> um, you know, I think that's a, that's, it's a super individual question. I have friends that are well older than me that that are, are still going super strong and and love it and are addicted to it there's some of the stats in that report talk about like gen x and baby boomers and percentages of, of those folks that are uh still doing this and it's higher than you would probably think uh it's like just 13 percent for baby boomers and like 27 percent something like that for gen x so so dale she can she can actually do this if she, she mentioned that she couldn't do it <laughs> um <laughs> But like for me, I, I've i noticed myself slowing down. I was much more gung-ho um, earlier and I, I wanted to at some point hit, like I want to go to every country. Yeah. That became like a sort of a meaningless pursuit to me after nothing really happened. I'm just kind of like, I'm not really experiencing things as much. I'm just kind of going to go now. And that, that shifted how I travel now. I just go much slower. And I consider Croatia basically where I live now. And so I just pretty much am in this location, but I feel feel comfortable going elsewhere, but I like the idea of having a home base. And I think that comes with, I guess, what you want out of life um, more, more than anything. I don't think there's a tap out age for anyone mm -hmm. in that sense. Yeah. Okay, Max. Yeah, for me, I, so I definitely uh, want to make Los Angeles my home base. Uh, the more I travel, like the more I, I realize just, you know, how privileged we are in America. And I'm so thankful for that. But at, at this point in my life, I feel that I can definitely travel to some more countries. I do kind of want to get like a, a home base, like a, a good routine gone, maybe instead of traveling for a year, you know, like two or three months, then coming back and touching base and going out again. And we'll see how things go. Nice. And uh, is, Rosie, what's going to get back you back to the office uh, full time? Are you ever going to do that? Probably <laughs> ne ne <Yeah>. never. <laughs> I yeah. sit in on the meetings where we discuss if that's an option. <laughs> um, no, I mean, I don't. I I think because my family is also international too. I feel like I I am international. You know, like I could apply for dual citizenship in Canada or the Philippines. I just um, haven't yet. And um, I also think for me specifically, I'm going to travel as much as I can while I physically can. You know, I think, uh, and I think you and I talked about this too when we were like in Egypt, like imagining traveling when 
we waited till we retired and could we physically do the things that we could do in this country like climb down this unstable ladder to see where the <laughs> tubes are buried and so i think that there is a little bit of a physical element for me where i i definitely want to travel as much as i can in addition though i'm absolutely fascinated by workplace culture not just in the us but globally um and so you know fortunately i i've the last couple companies I've worked with where we have multiple offices in other countries where I get to actually work with people in different countries. And so um, that's definitely of interest of mine. And I hope that never ends and continue to live the remote life. Nice. Okay. That's great. Um, I think this tends to be uh, an audience that maybe doesn't have kids, but maybe wants to have kids at a certain point. So I'm going to just plug for traveling with your kid. Um, I'm a big fan. I've, I've been to 71 countries and my kid is nine. My son is 19 and I think he's been to 20 countries now. 20, 27. No, he's, he's wrong. Oh, okay. We like to overmarket. We, we can also <laughs> debate countries versus territories, but uh, I have to say I took him and when he was very small and, you know, I had a big suitcase of Cheerios and toys and traveled with him during the time when they took all that away uh, because of terrorist activity. And, yeah, you know, there were, and I think the key for me was also bringing someone with me to help. So I wouldn't do it completely alone. I think also, I've been fortunate to teach abroad um, and have a home base. So I think having a home base and the, the cool thing about traveling with a kid, I'm just is that you see different things because when I, I remember going to England and we just did parks. I didn't see any museum, but we just did parks and we kept everything very early. So uh, I think I grew up in Fresno, so I did not grow up with a wealthy traveling global, fabulous, you know, lifestyle kind of family. I traveled for the first time studying abroad when I was 19 and I went to Italy and I was hooked. It is like a lifelong addiction. I mean, I'm just always ready for my next trip. And, and I'm going to just ask you all that, you know, what, where do you want to go next? I mean, I know for me, I'm jealous, Max. Galapagos is on my list. Where, what about what are a couple of places you want to go next, um, Steve? Yeah, so, so next, definitely uh, Southeast Asia, Bali, uh, Vietnam, uh, Thailand, Australia, just that part of the world. Like I've been to Asia before, just Japan though. So it's like all uncharted territory for me. And I, I hear they're supposed to have some of the best beaches in the world. So I'm super excited for that. Nice. Steve, how about you? Uh, I would say I got Japan up there at probably number one to go to. Uh, a lot more of uh, Eastern Europe in general. So, I mean, like Poland and Czech Republic and anything sort of East, I, I'm, I'm a fan of and want to go see. Uh, I would have said Georgia earlier, but I, I finally went in July and I, I will just plug Georgia aggressively because mm. if, if Georgia was in the same time zone as Croatia, I'd probably live in Georgia. Uh, oh. It's just Right now, it's a little, maybe a little bit weird with because they've had a massive influx of people due to the war um, coming in there. So it's a little bit different, but it is exceptional. So that's not on my wish list, but I plan to go there like a lot. So, wow, I am excited to hear that because that has not been on my list. And since you just said that, I'm going to put that on my it's list. So good. If, I mean, there's. If, it's got, it's basically right on sort of the, the old spice trail, sort of Silk Road trading route. Uh -huh. And so where it is geographically with Turkey, Azerbaijan, Armenia, and Russia, and in that little pocket, there's uh -huh. a massive mix of culture and food and they, their cradle of winemaking. They basically started Ooh. making wine 8,000 years ago. And it's like insanely beautiful. It's at the foot of the Caucasus Mountains. So yeah, it's, it's ludicrous. It's gorgeous. It's delicious. <gasps> I would just go there. Oh my gosh. <laughs> I think we're all going to Georgia now. Rosie, how about you? What's next? Where do you, what's on your um, list? I just want to point out that you haven't mentioned yet. I feel like Ellen beats us on the amount of countries that we've been to. So Ellen, how many yeah. countries have you been to? Oh, I think I said that 71. Not that 71. I mean, not that <laughs> counting. 
<laughs> um, we're totally counting. Um, I think for me, I'm really, uh, same with Steve, I'm really excited to go to Poland. I, I almost went to Poland last month and then I had some work stuff come up, so I had to postpone that. Um, the other one, I'm really excited to go to New Zealand. Um, New Zealand is definitely on my radar for next year. Um, and uh, gosh, I think a lot of it is like, I'm really excited to go back to places too, you know, like um, I went to Japan for like a layover, which was like the worst tease ever. And so I definitely need to go back to Japan. Um, and like Croatia, I just feel like is going to be my second future home at some point because I just, I love going back there. And I have yet to even explore a lot of the Northern part of Croatia. Nice. It's, it's great. It's where I am right yeah. now. It's great. So. <laughs> yeah. So, um, not that we're competitive, not that traveler, intrepid travelers are competitive with country counting, but can we all agree on the ground rule that you have to, like, at least spend the whole day? You have to leave the airport or spend a night in order to count that country. What do you, what do you think about that? Yeah, I, well, it's weird. I used, I used to, I had, I, I've had much, like, I've had a sliding scale, let's say. So, like, okay. I think you have to do something that's culturally representative of the place and be there for like, I would I don't know if hours it matters necessarily, but like I was in Austria on Saturday. I was only there on Saturday, but I was do like went to do things that were Austrian for the entire day. I was speaking with Austrian people in the like sort of market in their main square. I'm gonna count that as being there, but it's not like I spent a night there. So it's a sliding scale, but I think it's the cultural or learning element, if you can interact with the society in some way, that's how I count my countries. <laughs> so, so layovers don't count. Layovers don't count. Layovers don't way. count. So we yeah. all agree. Layovers yeah. don't count. <laughs> um, all right. I'm going to go ahead and open it up um, for questions. Is there a way we can see those or see our audience? And then I, I know we've got uh, people. Oh, I see them right here. Here we go. How are Ruth? Hi, Ruth. Um, says, how are you able to find freelancing gigs or remote work opportunities? That is a great question. I think I could I could probably take that. Yeah. Uh, so when I start, so I, I I'll backtrack a tiny bit and explain something, and then get to the answer. So I was, as I mentioned, I was a video producer, and I stopped that during COVID. Well, COVID stopped that. I didn't really have a choice. Uh, okay. But then I realized I didn't really like it that much and I'm like when I didn't have any work and was like not just chomping at the bit to shoot stuff or do, do things of that nature I'm kind of like maybe I should not go back to this and so I'm like all right now's a chance to change so I had heard of Upwork I was not using it so I made an account on Upwork and I basically spent many hours figuring out how to make money on Upwork and I started with horrible horrible low-paying gigs um I think the first thing I got paid to write was like $18. And I was so stoked that someone paid me. I was like, I'm a pro writer. Got paid $18. Um, <laughs> but, but, and so it was, it, was, it was a process of slowly um, building up on there, figuring out how to sort of put a portfolio together for, for the thing I was trying to do, which was be a better writer. And I uh, got better jobs by eight, eight months of that process. I was making enough to move to Croatia. And then like now I've become a contributor to CNBC and World Nomads and, and a few other publications and have a copywriting business. So it started from that sort of little stepping stone thing. I set little small goals, like I wanna make $20 writing this week. And something that's achievable is the strategy I would take. So if you set your goal as I wanna make 9K a month and I wanna be published, just that and the other, just you're gonna set yourself up to fail. So small incremental little steps uh, that you can really achieve and not you know, you need to rack up wins is, is another way to put it. And uh, slowly doing that gives you confidence and you have a portfolio, then you move on to bigger clients and you stop competing on price. You start competing on value. You're delivering. That's that how I would say to do it. That's how I did it. And that's what works for people is just putting in the time and, and growing that way. That's wonderful. That's an excellent answer. Max, Rosie, you want to add anything to that? Um, I would probably add that like my my remote jobs, I definitely was living on LinkedIn for a little bit um, and Indeed and other places, um, especially while I was still in digital nomad phase and trying to figure out how to get back into the industry and make the like 
well, get back into a full-time job and like um, <laughs> trying to change careers. Um, and so I think LinkedIn definitely has a remote feature. Um, so, you know, I mentioned earlier about like being able to work somewhere. A lot of it is tax related too. So if like a company is set up to do taxes in certain states and you could be like remote from that state or, or even that country, I think that's definitely something to ask in interview processes too. Um, I think that's what helped determine a lot of like where I was going to be based out of or which companies I wanted to interview for. So like, for example, if there were certain companies that were fully remote, but they could only do taxes out of Canada, I'm not living in Canada currently, and I, I legally can't unless they set that up for me. So, you know, it helped, it helped um, me filter on what jobs I would be applying to that were either fully remote remote or partially remote. Great. Thanks. Max, you want to add anything? Oh, uh, unfortunately, I don't have any advice on this as I'm kind of going okay. more entrepreneurial route. <laughs> sure. Well, actually, Rosie, I'm glad you mentioned the taxes because uh, we have a pretty awesome accounting um, group here. We've got super smart grads and one and students have one asked as an LMU CBA accounting graduate, is it difficult to file your taxes with the international nomad lifestyle? Great question. That's totally Steve. <laughs> uh, I just pay somebody to do that. I don't even, I still, I'm, I'm, I apparently a functioning adult, but I never learned how to do taxes. Uh, so, and yeah, so I have, I, have a family friend that is now my accountant uh, who I just send everything to. And so if, like, he's much older than me. So when he dies, I, I'll have to learn how to do taxes, I guess. But uh, as of now, that's how I do it. Um, it's it's not complex. I mean, it's basically doable. I, I could figure it out, obviously. It's not that hard. But um, how I handle it now is listening to him. Um, and there's tax services that are pretty affordable, I would say. So I don't know if that's like the best answer, <laughs> it's, what I, it's what I personally do. Okay, that's so, great. So me, for me, the answer is no, it's not difficult. Both my companies are based in California. And regardless of where I work, since I have a home base in California, taxes is super easy. All my clients are basically in the States. So it ends up, I don't have to do much international. Uh, every now and then there's someone international. But either way, I, everything I get like 1099 from, from companies and, and things, or W9, W2, 1099. It's too many forms, but I have to fill out a lot of forms and I get those all back to do taxes. So it ends up being fairly easy. Um, and actually, maybe to add this, I do know this. So my parents are planning on retiring in our house in the Philippines. And so what I do know that as part of their plan is that every February and March, they actually have to fly back to the States to file their taxes. Even though they'll be retired in the States to continue to get the retirement out of the U.S. while living in another country, they still have to fly home every year to get that piece done. Mm -hmm. interesting yeah max anything you want to say about taxes or are you yeah i i've just been using turbo tax file my own taxes I've, i haven't had any issues it's been a smooth process okay that's great uh one person asked how much research do you do before visiting the country and where and I think what they mean by that is like what are your best sources of research? I mean, there's, there's so much information these days. You know, you probably have something better than just googling. <laughs> yeah, I, I can answer that. So for yeah. me, I do a fair amount of research, especially uh, you want to get familiar with the area you're in. Uh, see like notable points of interest. You know, make sure you're in a main area. Maybe <clears throat> if, if you don't plan on riding a car, which is it's way easier, just walking everywhere, and uh, just getting familiar with the area, seeing what's nearby. Uh, also SIM cards, like seeing which uh, SIM card providers are the best for cell phone service. Also, if you're a digital nomad, Wi-Fi is a big deal. So you wanna make sure like the Wi-Fi speeds are pretty fast wherever you're going. That's good advice. Yeah, and I'll add to that in terms of uh, like a cell phone situation, if you, if you, are traveling all the time. Like I have a Google Fi account, which works in every single country. Um, it's not like the greatest rate, um, but as soon as you land somewhere, you're connected. And so I use that until I get myself a local SIM card. That's excellent. You're never without a phone if you if you use that. There might be other services that do that, but I, I've had them for a while. 
Um, and then in terms of picking destinations, uh, also what, what Max said, Wi-Fi is, is, is critical. I always pick places in the city center because uh, I don't, I want to be able to walk everywhere. And research wise, with respect to, I guess, where on earth, I used to be really meticulous back in the day. I would like really plan and like, this is what I want to do, this is what I want to see, this is how I want to do it. This, and I, I didn't leave a lot of room for spontaneity and like the magic of a place to, to happen because I was over planned. So I do the opposite now. I don't plan anything. I just find kind of where I want to go. And then I get there, I'll do I'll do free walking tour often, like like Max said, because it'll take you to the best stuff. And I try to ask somebody when I arrive, because no one's gonna tell you the worst thing to do in their city or country. No mm -hmm. one's no one's gonna no one's gonna sabotage you like that. So you get there, you go to a cafe, you're like, hey, where, where should where should I see? And they'll tell you usually the main things, and then also things that are much cooler and more interesting and maybe off the beaten path that those specific people uh, like about the place. Um, nice. I, I feel like that's like the best way to figure out where to go to is just ask a local. Like I never go on Yelp or like look for best restaurant food recommendations. Like it's first coffee shop I go to figure out if they're from here <laughs> and just ask like, where would you guys want to go eat? Um, so I, 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 I kind of agree with Steve. Like I used to plan things out so much and I, I just don't anymore. Like now I have like two or three things I have to do in every country and it doesn't matter when it happens as long as we just do those two or three things um and so then i feel like i'm fully satisfied in the trip and as maybe someone who likes checking boxes if i get those three things done on like the first day then it's like the whole trip is super spontaneous so you know i think uh uh when it comes to just thinking of what those three three things are i i mean like the fact is i stay busy you know like i i, I work i like to dance and Unfortunately, I don't have a lot of time for research and planning, um, but what I do use, and I think this is like a little Instagram trick, is I do follow a lot of like travel accounts. And so anytime I see something that like, oh, I want to see that or I want to go there, um, Instagram has a feature where if you save a photo, you can make collections. And yeah. so all my collections are by country or city. So like if I'm following an Italy account and all these places pop up for Venice because I've never been to Venice, then I start saving all those or I haven't been to Poland yet. So now I'm kind of getting an idea of what I want to see. And then I'll just pick like the top three from that collection and be like, okay, these are three things that I have to do when I get there. And I'm going to go do those. Um, and I believe you can turn the collection into a quick travel guide on Instagram. So it, it has all those like quick features for someone who is just too busy to just do research. But I mean, I, you know, unfortunately I, I am on my social media, even if I'm not posting at a, a in real time rate, because I have a job, <laughs> but, um, but I still use social media as like a way to like collect information and see what, where other people have traveled and use their research to my benefit. <laughs> Got it. We have a couple more questions left and then we'll do a wrap up. So this one's for Steve, actually. Why is Croatia home base for you? How would you compare it to living in a city like LA or New York? And how long did it take you to learn Croatian? So that's like a three in one. Why is it yeah. home base compared? Uh, I I think part of part of why is so my family is, is Slavic. And growing up, we always had these like get togethers where we massive play tables of food and was laughing music was playing it just was very familiar like thing I got used to obviously it's your family when I came to any Slavic country that I've been to whether it's here Montenegro Serbia Ukraine whatever uh all of that is very it reminds me of that the sort of how people exist um so part of it is related to that another part is I, I find the, the history here fascinating so I like being able to walk in that every day whether it's like Diocletian's palace in Split or like the more Austro-Hungarian vibes you get in Zagreb, that I love. And then food is great here. There's the cost of living advantage is uh, just ridiculous. As Max said, dollar goes really far in certain places. Croatia, not the cheapest place in Europe, but I think bang for your buck is pretty extraordinary here. And I don't know, I just, after traveling for basically a decade, I got here and felt all those things. And then there's the intangibles of just kind of right place, right time. And I, I fell in love with it. So I've always been, I've been coming back. Uh, first came in 2014, then 2019 twice. And then I moved in 2020. 
So that's that's that answer. Um, I don't know Croatian, <laughs> so okay. Every, oh, okay. every, yeah, everyone like in Zagreb and any of the coastal places, ev basically everyone speaks English if they're under, let's say, like fifty, and that's and then it's still older people speak English. Only the language barrier places when you go to like the the market. Um, it's like usually older people there. And so I know because I know Russian, I can get by this is Slavic. I know uh, like there's not a ton of overlap, but there's enough overlap where I can kind of get by it to to sort of say something. But I do intend to actually like go take courses and learn properly because I'm annoyed with my inability to communicate on a deep level because it helps you solve problems. Um you can get by without it, but to get deeper problems solved, I always have to call like my Croatian friends to like help me out with, with certain things like administrative stuff and stuff like that. Yeah. So I, I think that was, was that all? Was that yeah, all it? All I think you got it. That's perfect. Thank you. Yeah. Um, I think for our last question, we'll take it from um, Lisa Loberg, our study abroad director. What is, she wants to know, and I think we all would like to know, what is a typical workday look like for each of you? <laughs> so different, right? Yeah, yeah. who wants to go first? Max? Yeah, yeah. So uh, for me, I kind of feel like each day is, is always changing. You know, one day I might be waking up early in the morning to like go shoot a hike or, or something like that or the next day. Um, but I generally I try to uh, have a pretty good morning routine where I wake up uh, morning, where I wake up, go to the gym, meditate, you know, then do some work. But uh, being a content creator, like I'm creating content. So a lot of my job is like filming uh, my adventures. So, you know, one day I could wake up and go diving in the morning then you know maybe do editing in the evening the next day it could be like just a, a straight work day of editing uh the next day it could be like you know slam packed with visiting uh different people experiencing like their neighborhoods or trying different foods so it's it's ever changing and that's something that i really like about being a digital nomad it's like the, the freshness and the newness of it all yeah right on thank you um how about Rosie and then we'll, we'll end up with? Well, I guess I'll share my typical work day as if I wasn't here in Los Angeles. Yeah. Um, because that's just like, you know, typical. Well, to actually, to be fair, because we're, um, I'm in a hybrid, um, lots of the hybrid environments, they don't care when you work. It's just that you get your work done and you show up for the meeting. So a lot of the time I do find myself maybe working a couple hours in the morning um, doing like, ballet class for lunch, um, maybe an errand, and then coming back and doing work afterwards. But when I'm in, for example, I worked in uh, Budapest for a week, um, a couple weeks, actually. And I started out my morning actually just walking around. I love waking up early before anybody else's and just not seeing too many tourists around. So I always try to get up before everybody else and go for walks. Um, then I'll, you know, uh, like Steve, I like to make sure I can walk to everything too. That's like busy um, and just get some coffee, maybe go explore something new um, by lunchtime and then head back to wherever I'm staying um, about maybe three, four o'clock, take a quick nap before I have to start working Eastern Standard Time <laughs> around 5 p.m. in that country and then working through the evening at a regular schedule. That's beautiful. Thank you. Steve, we'll wrap it up with you. Yeah, mine is, uh, I, I try and keep a pretty consistent routine. Uh, basically, I do a little morning routine uh, as, as well. Uh, just a few basic things that I try and do every day. So it's wake up, do some physical thing um, for a few minutes just to get the blood flow and have coffee. Try not to touch my phone for the first 30 minutes um, and then sort of get into catching up on stuff. Then it's work. I, I, I'm at my most productive um, time, like work-wise, in the morning hours. So I try and knock out a bunch of stuff between like eight and twelve-ish. Then I'll go out to the gym when it's completely empty around lunchtime, or go running or something. Then come back for like a, a second stretch of work, depending on what needs to be done. And then usually by I don't know four or five. I don't I don't have to work that many hours. So a lot of it's just planning when I need I need to be doing stuff and then after that it's exploring so it's a it's, it's a typical work day because I'm like I'm here and so like I can't just like randomly go do stuff during the day with people because they're like all working <laughs> so yeah. I explore by myself during yeah. the days and then uh, I go go connect in the evenings go to happy hours and stuff like that but um yeah it's pretty I, honestly it's weirdly boring in that sense 
like Max is it could, as a content creator, he's out there doing different things like that. I'm kind of like, I just work like a nine to five just in Croatia. <laughs> <laughs> yeah but i choose but i choose i choose how i do it when i do it so it's i but i like that for my mental sort of consistency well-being sort of thing it helps me it's great well it's all about choice that is the mm -hmm. key choice and some variety oh my gosh so i see uh, my colleague's face and um i think that that is our signal to wrap up so i want to just say how grateful I am to each of you for participating and to Dr. Peck for having um, us on this panel and for uh, the center for, for supporting us. And also for Mark, who's been in the background, but is, has been immensely supportive and helpful and kind of the wind beneath our rings and, and, and okay. as well, so. Okay, great, Ellen. Thank you so much for moderating such an intriguing panel discussion. And I also would like to thank Rosie, Max, and Steve uh, for sharing your experiences and insights with us about this timely and important topic today. Steve, I actually that um, I was a bit surprised when you said the digital nomads are paid better than a traditional office job. I thought and actually, one of the downside of digital nomad is that you actually work harder for less pay. They're they're not paid better. They're happier. They're happier with what they get paid because okay. they have the freedom <laughs> to choose how they like. I get paid fairly well. I don't I don't mind what I get paid, but uh, it's true that I think on aggregate people get paid less uh, working remotely. But if you're doing an entrepreneurial thing, you your sky is your limit to the clients you can get. But it's the happiness and this fulfillment they get is that's higher. So I see. So I got your point. Great. I know most of our audience are students. Uh, so if you do not mind, then actually I save the last question for you guys. In pursuing digital nomad career, what do you think are the most important skills or the competencies you must develop? Is it language proficiency? And obviously, Max doesn't think it's that important. Technical knowledge, perseverance, patience, or open-mindedness. What do you think are the most important traits that most desirable to pursue this kind of lifestyle or career? Anyone? I, I think I'll kick us off. Um, I think the most important thing is curiosity. You know, okay. I think, um, and I say that because it's not just in travel, but in business and in, in our careers and our education, just having ongoing curiosity because there are things that we want to learn in other countries um, and while traveling, but there's a lot that we'll learn unexpectedly in the process that may be so foreign to us. Um, but, you know, I grew up with a very <clears throat> international family, so being accepting other cultures just felt a little bit more normal, but I noticed how I had to be more cognizant of being curious to other cultures that may not have been similar to what I grew up with. And I, and I say that because we need that curiosity, not just in like um, interacting with other cultures, but in how we like interact with them as well, like in constantly evolving how we show up in these countries um, as workers or tourists or trying to make it as part of our, our community while we're living in, in other places. So just constantly staying curious and not being quick to judge or think you have, you know it all. I think my favorite story to tell when I come to LMU is the hardest feedback I've ever gotten is that I didn't take feedback well. <laughs> and I just remember thinking, yes, I do. And I remember breaking down crying and then I went home and I was like, did I just not take feedback well about not taking feedback well? And so you know, I use that same curiosity and approach now if, uh, because there's so many different things that we don't expect out of uh, cultures and it is trial and error and it's a lot of failure and it's a lot of getting feedback in different ways that we don't expect. So uh, definitely, you know, practice your curiosity where you're at because it's going to continue to be needed as you grow um, in whatever industry and country you end up in. Yeah. That's exactly what I told my students, a driver. That's a driver, right? That to keep you going forward. Okay, Max, Steve? Yeah, I agree with everything Rosalind said. I would definitely want to add, uh, be flexible, like flexibility and just uh, an openness to learn uh, and just realizing, you know, things may not be the same as they are in America and kind of uh, just like a go with the flow mentality, like a resiliency, like if things aren't going your way and just, 
being open to experience other cultures without uh, questioning it and just being open to new experiences and trying new foods and just being in being being comfortable with being discomfortable that that I would say that because you're going to be discomfortable a lot traveling and having experiences that you're not used to yeah yeah I'd, I'd agree with with all of that I'd add uh probably to try to not be afraid to fail you you are going to be required to, in a, in a, to fail in a way that is going to be unique to you because there's you're not in a job that's going to be in an office necessarily you're going to be in a new sort of work workforce basically so failing often and failing quickly is is i think advisable uh the more you can get that out of the way the more you'll learn the more you grow the more you can sort of leverage those um newfound lessons in in future growth so that that's a big one uh is not to just be afraid to take those risks and then in terms of stuff that's like a little bit less tangible like availability as because you max it flexibility but availability one of the best abilities is just to be available to do the thing that needs to be done um and not being too busy for certain things and weirdly just a basic likability is something that will take you so far it's right. ridiculous like a lot of my my best clients are not it's not that i'm the most competent writer we just have an extremely good relationship and we right. there's a trust built off of that so not thinking of yourself too highly and since just being like a decent person gets uh -huh. you so far in life. Um, then that's that's just a good tip in general. <laughs> Great answers. Um, you know, students, uh, if you want to prepare digital nomad as your career path, I strongly encourage you to participate in LNU or some other school study abroad program before you graduate. And then the MBA program integrates a study trip called the CMS, Comparative Management System, into its curriculum. We also offer a great master's degree program called the MGEM, Master in Global Entrepreneurial Management. This is a full-time joint degree program between three universities in Barcelona, New Taipei City, and of course, Los Angeles, where our school is located spending each semester in turn. Marky, I'm sure that, that you have a slide to show uh, share. So actually this program is ranked number one in the world for international course experience by the Financial Times in 2022. The engine program will give you the skills and tools to expand your view and lead with entrepreneurial mindset in the global market. Well, I'd like to thank all of you who joined the webinar today. I hope you have enjoyed the program. We'll be back with another program in spring 2023. Until then, please stay safe and healthy. Before you leave, I would appreciate it if you can complete the short survey at the end of this webinar. Thank you so much, everyone, and good night. Thank you, everybody. Good night or goodbye. <laughs> Thank <laughs> Sleep you. Well, wherever you're calling from.